Okay, well, I, I just want to uh, say thank you really to three groups of people, uh, to th three very important entities. This has been a very successful program. Uh, we have uh, produced some wonderful science done by the students uh, as the faculty mentors. So first of all, I want to thank the students for taking from your uh, medical school careers the time to engage in scientific activity. Um, it not only benefits you, but of course it benefits everyone from the knowledge that's generated. I also want to thank the faculty because taking on a medical student is not just a way to get papers published. It really becomes a tremendous responsibility and is often time consuming and requires a lot of input. So I want to thank the faculty those of you who have uh, mentored the students. And last, and of course, in many ways most, I want to thank Ann Cole. Uh, for those of you who didn't know Bill Cole, and I think that that's almost everybody except me uh, here at this meeting, Bill Cole, who you see on the left here of the slide, uh, was a very warm and gracious and talented ophthalmologist who uh, spent many, many hundreds of hours in the Department of Ophthalmology. And his mission was to teach medical students the rudiments of the ophthalmic examination. And he would come every week with this wonderful smile on his face. He's a very patient and uh, enthusiastic ophthalmologist who spent a lot of time with the students. And then when he passed away, his, his wife, and the Cole family decided to extend his investment in ophthalmology by giving us this wonderful opportunity to provide uh, support for students who wanted to do research in ophthalmology, I think with the idea that they would someday contribute to the field. So I wanna thank Ann Cole and her entire family for supporting this wonderful program, which. Uh, has now really uh, shown its, its, its benefits. So with that, I, with all the thanks said, I'd like to turn the program over to Annie Bake, who has really been in charge of this program, and I look forward to hearing the presentations. Um, tonight, I'm happy to say we have seven recipients of um, this year's Cole Summer Scholarship, and um, we're going to hear a variety of presentations. Um, I wanted to again extend my thanks to our retina faculty who've really been instrumental in providing really high quality mentorship and research um, to all these students. And I'm happy to see we have, have students from multiple institutions, not just UC Davis. Um, so I hope that we continue to see this program grow um, and that we contribute to the future of ophthalmology. So our first student presenter this evening is gonna be um, Jacob Avalon who comes to us from California, uh, North State University, our neighbors to the South. Um, so Jacob, take it away. Uh, my name is Jacob Avalon. I'm a second year medical student at California, North State University. Uh, my mentor is Dr. Glenn Yu. Uh, he works at the Department of Ophthalmology at UC Davis. And today I'm gonna be talking about how intraoperative retinal changes may predict anatomical outcomes after epiremet Epiretinal membrane peeling surgery. So first up, what is an ERM or epiretinal membrane? Um, if we look over to the right on the picture, you can see this white semi-translucent tissue sitting right on top of the retina. And then at some points, it's actually tugging on the retina, creating traction. So as you can imagine, this uh, can really affect a patient's vision and uh, Luckily, there are treatments for it and it involves surgery. Um, some of the primary causes is, of course, idiopathic, but a lot of times it's secondary to other processes. Um, majorly, it's uh, diabetic retinopathy, retinal vein occlusions, inflammatory diseases, and then we also have trauma, surgery, tumors, or uh, retinal tears or detachments. So what's our question? Our question is, can intraoperative retinal changes predict anatomical and vision outcomes in patients undergoing ERM peeling? 
Um, and the way we look at intraoperative changes is with this new emerging technology called intraoperative OCT. So if we look over towards the right hand side of the screen, we can see an example image of an OCT scan. Uh, basically, it's a cross section of the retina. And normally this is done in an office setting. Uh, it's not normally done in the OR suite, but new technology has allowed the application of OCT to be used intraoperatively. And so surgeons can take advantage of a live OCT scan as they're operating. So to start answering our question, the way we started and approached this was we wanted to take OCT images at different time points. Of course, we will start with a preoperative OCT scan with a conventional machine. And then as the patient is undergoing surgery, we take intraoperative OCT, so IOCTs. So we take it right before the surgery. PPV stands for pars plane of vitrectomy. That's when you take the jelly outside of the eyeball. And then post-MP or post-membrane peeling, so right after the surgeon peels that epiretinal membrane out, off of the retina. So we have very, very close time points for the intraoperative OCT that allows us to see the changes. And then post-operatively, we take OCT scans one and three months after surgery. All along the way, we, take, uh, we keep track of the visual acuity. So after we get these IOCT images, which we can see on the right here, this is an example of one, we have to calculate the central macular thickness. Um, in this image, the macula is not seen, but this is just an example where we can see the ERM on top, and then we would take a measurement from the top all the way down to the bottom to the RPE, and then that would give us the macular thickness. Um, afterwards, uh, we take all of these images and then we try and correlate them with uh, post-operative anatomical changes, which is measured by conventional OCT, and then of course, visual outcomes. So to talk a little bit more about the image processing, over here, we can see an example of how uh, the raw images are segmented, meaning that we are marking the borders of the retina. So this is the top part, and then this is the bottom part where the RPE is. And this is done semi-automatically, meaning the first part or the first step is done with an algorithm or a computer. And then we go over each image by hand to make sure that the lines are actually where they're supposed to be. So just to give you an idea, um, each patient had multiple scans, uh, primarily before and after the surgery. And each OCT scan, which we see in the middle here, this is a top-down view, there's 128 slices. And since each patient got about two, each patient got 256 scans. And then over the 27 patients, we had to process about 6,000 images by computer and by hand. Uh, luckily, I only did nine of the patients. The other 20 or so was done by uh, our colleague. Um, and then here we can just see a 3D representation of the macular thickening. So uh, starting off with results, um, our patient population, we had 27 eyes out of 27 patients. The average age was about 68 years old. We had a pretty even split between male and female and right and left eyes. Uh, we had 19 phacic eyes and eight pseudophagic eyes. So 19 uh, patients that had their natural lens who, and who didn't get cataract surgery just yet. So uh, just some baseline results. Uh, before surgery, uh, the mean visual acuity was about 2060 or 2063, and the mean central macular thickness of it was about 489. Just to give you an idea, 489 is quite high. It's actually uh, more than double the usual amount. Um, during surgery, uh, the intraoperative CMT measurements, we found that a change was about uh, 39 microns. Um, interestingly, the patients, uh, most of the patients had thinning right after surgery, as is expected when you take off the membrane, but a few patients actually had thickening. But overall, the change in amount was about 39.6 microns. Then after surgery, uh, the patients overall improved. We, their vision improved to 2050 at one month, and then about 2040-ish at three months, which is much better than the original 2060. Um, and then the central macular thickness was about uh, 397 at, uh, during the post-op period. So just to get started on some quality control, 
Um, because this, I, this intraoperative OCT, a lot of the measurements are corrected by hand. We wanted to make sure that the measurements done during surgery uh, correlated with like conventional OCT machines. And we can see that there's a nice correlation between our measurements and conventional OCTs taken right before surgery. So we see a uh, correlation of 0.9, that's good. And a p-value below 0.01, so that's really good. So here's the fun stuff, the actual results. Uh, so post-op anatomical outcomes. Um, so just to break down these graphs, so over on the left-hand side, we have it at post-op month one, and we look at the ice central macular thickness changes, and then we correlate that to the macular thickness changes we see post-operatively. And as we can see here, there's a general downward trend, meaning that greater the change we see during surgery sort of predicts uh, the amount of change or the amount of anatomical restoration that we'll see post-op. And so here we see the changes correlate nicely at one month and at three months. So what we really wanted to see is if there's, if we can actually predict visual outcomes. Um, over here on the left, we see, we kind of see a trend line over here, um, but, and the p-value works out nicely, but up here towards the upper part of the graph, uh, a lot of the data points are kind of still clustered, and uh, we think that these two strong outliers are kind of pulling the trend in a favorable direction. So we can't really know definitively if we can actually predict uh, post-op visual outcomes, and it becomes even more apparent at three months when the cluster has almost no correlation at all. But it's a possibility at one month. So over here, it's a whole lot of numbers. I call it the big stats table. Um, it's a lot to look at, but I would start off with the colors. Um, so these green colors uh, over here, we're looking at the post-op uh, central macular thickness changes. So we're not looking at vision at this point. We're just looking at what the retina looks like after surgery. And we're correlating that to the amount of intra, uh, intraoperative macular thickness changes. So we see with the p-values are quite low, and that means it gives like a strong indication that they are somewhat related. Um, and then if we go one row down where we look at the ICMT change with direction, uh, like I said before, some of the maculas or retinas got thicker right after surgery or during surgery. And this just accounts for the retinas that got thicker and thinner, whereas the one above here just looked directly at the amount of change in thickness. So we didn't find a correlation there, and uh, that was also confirmed in a multivariate regression. So for those who may not be super um, like uh, into stats, uh, multivariate just takes in a lot of the other confounding factors that may also contribute to this relationship. So things like age or past history of cataract surgery, um, gender, things like that, that may also play into a role about the relationship between post-op anatomical changes and intraoperative changes. So over here uh, on the vision half of the table, we can see that some of the p-values line up nicely. We have 0.03, but like I said earlier, some of the outliers may have been a factor in looking at the trends. So that's why they're in orange. So just to start to sum up, um, we found that eyes that underwent a greater intraoperative uh, central macular thickness change uh, was associated with a greater reduction uh, postoperatively at months one and three. Um, and we also found that there was a possible greater change in uh, vision improvements at one month, uh, but not at three months. However, like I said before, this may be just due to a couple strong outliers. Um, so just to really sum up, basically what I said earlier, and then finally, um, intraoperative OCT with this new emerging technology may actually demonstrate something that we haven't really looked at before, which is retinal stiffness. So we can see that it may demonstrate retinal stiffness and predict surgical outcomes after ERM peeling. So that sums up the presentation. This is the acknowledgments. I'd like to, of course, thank my mentor, Dr. Yu, for really, um, you know, not only setting the foundation for this project, but also just, you know, guiding me and teaching me, you know, step by step how to, you know, do basic science research in ophthalmology. 
And of course, the first thought to hear Dr. Makamala, who really started the project and did much of the foundational work. And then, of course, Mrs. Uh, Ann Cole. So thank you very much. Thanks so much, Jacob. We can see you put in an enormous amount of work. And we can also see how this will potentially change the course of our management. So um, here we can see a really, really tangible potential application for um, the future of ophthalmology. Um, we're next going to hear from Justine Chi, who's from Oakland University Wilman, William Beaumont School of Medicine in Michigan. Hi, my name is Justine Chi. I am a second year medical student at, at currently attending Oakland University William Beaumont School of Medicine, which is located in Rochester, Michigan, which is right around here. It's around Detroit, Michigan, but I'm originally from Chicago. And so my mentor is Dr. Ala Moshiri. And the title of our project is Genome-Wide Screening of Single Gene Knockout Mice Reveals Novel Genes That Are Required for Early Eye Formation. And so the importance of our study is that basically we are trying to identify novel genes and the pathways that they act upon during early eye formation. And so just to give a background on the subset of congenital eye diseases we were interested in, um, we studied a spectrum of congenital eye disorders called MAC spectrum disorders. So MAC stands for microphthalmia, which you could see right here, stand, shows small eye phenotype within the infants, um, anophthalmia, which is no eye phenotype within the infants, and coloboma, which is a defect within optic fissure fusion. And so the genetics behind about 80% or so of these max spectrum disorders are already known in literature, and they're caused by the genes SOX2 and OTX2. However, the genes and the pathways that are involved within the other 20% of max spectrum disorder genes are unknown. And so the importance of my project is that we would like to hasten the diagnosis and treatment of this congenital blinding disease utilizing gene knockout models within mice in order to see if they contribute to early eye formation. And so the database where we got our gene information from is called the International Mouse Phenotyping Consortium, abbreviated IMPC. And so there are about 24 of these IMPC centers worldwide, and three of them are located within the United States. And so one of them is at UC Davis, the other one's at Baylor University, and the third one's at Jackson Laboratories in Maine. And so the purpose of the IMPC centers is to make a single gene knockout for every single mouse gene within the mouse genome, meaning there are about 20,000 genes within the genome, and we're trying to characterize them by knocking out each one of them. And what I mean by knockout mice is that um, you get like a normal mouse that has normal genes and you intentionally delete both copies of one of the genes in order to see what the function of the gene is. And in our case, we want to see if the particular gene that's been knocked out contributes to a small eye phenotype or no eye phenotype, which corresponds to max spectrum disorder. And so the reason that we use mouse data is that mice and humans are genetically very similar. We both have around 20,000 genes within our genome. And this is what makes mouse study really important to understanding human disease. And so by screening the IMPC database for mouse embryos that had these ocular defects of either the small or no eye phenotype, we were able to discover 63 genes that contribute to early eye formation. 13 of these 63 genes were already studied within humans in previous literature studies. So therefore, 50 of these genes are found to be novel genes that contribute to early eye formation, meaning they have not been found in previous studies to be associated with early eye formation. And so if you look here in the first row, you can see that these mice have very small eye phenotypes when you compare it to the control group on the left side, which is the normal mice. This represents microophthalmia. And the row on the bottom represents anophthalmia, which is the no eye phenotype, and you can see here, compared to the control group again, that they have no eyes. 
And so these are some lists of the genes that are known to cause both microophthalmia and anophthalmia from our IMPC database screening. And so we wanted to take it a step further and not just identify the genes that are involved in early eye formation, but also the pathways upon which these genes act upon. And so we decided to utilize a bioinformatic tool called string analysis in order to combine both the known human genes to cause max spectrum disorder, along with mice genes from our study and create a network to see how they interact with each other. And so by doing so, we were able to discover two potentially novel pathways that contribute to early eye formation. The first one being the serine glycine biosynthetic pathway, and the second one being a series of three signaling pathways that contribute to the pluripotency of stem cells. And so the genes in blue are our mouse genes from the IMPC database. The genes in gray are the human genes, so genes known to cause max spectrum disorder in humans, and the genes in red are basically a gene that's known to cause eye defects in both the mice and humans. So the first pathway that I kind of drew out here is the serine glycine pathway. And this pathway is basically a subset of the folate cycle. And this is really, and I have right on the right here, the string analysis of the serine glycine pathway, which shows the interaction of these genes with one another. And the importance of this pathway is that the Foley cycle, if in humans, it's known that you know if mothers who are pregnant need to have a good supplement of Foley in their diet because if they don't, this could potentially cause neural tube defects. And so neural tube development also corresponds to eye development. And so by elucidating this pathway of four enzymes right here, highlighted in purple, shown within our string analysis, it shows that by having a defect within the formation of the serine glycine pathway. This prevents folate from being formed within the cells. And this is important because it shows that by having a lack of folate, this can potentially cause the eye defects of microophthalmia and anophthalmia. And this pathway has never been mentioned in previous literature. So we believe that this is a novel pathway that we were able to find with our research. The second pathway that we were able to find are a series of three signaling pathways that are known to be important for embryonic development. And so the first pathway is the sonic hedgehog pathway, which is a very well-known pathway for embryonic development, shown by our string analysis of human genes. The second pathway is the transforming growth factor beta pathway, which is this big pathway here. And it's um, characterized by string analysis right here. And our third pathway is the wind signaling pathway. And so while these um, pathways are known to contribute to embryonic development, they are not, their um, significance within early eye development is not very well known. And so we have here how all three of these pathways localize to the development of SOX2 gene, which is an already known gene to cause max spectrum disorder and it causes lens differentiation. So we believe that these three signaling pathways play a key role within embryonic eye development. While we were looking at our 63 IMPC genes, we happened to um, stumble upon a gene that contributes to a very rare phenotype called cyclopia. And you can see right here in our mouse model that cyclopia is basically having a singular eye in the center of the face. So basically turning the baby into a cyclops. And so basically this mutation is caused by defects within the sonic hedgehog pathway, which is highlighted right here. However, we were able to discover a gene called ACVR28, which it corresponds to the sonic hedgehog pathway that contributes to this embryonic disorder. And so this is a very rare and exciting finding we're able to find with our research. So to basically summarize the main points of my research project, there are 114 known human genes that contribute to congenital eye disease. We were able to identify 63 mouse genes that contribute to congenital eye disease on top of the 114 genes. 13 of these genes are already known to contribute to eye defects within humans. So 50 of these genes are rare and are therefore considered novel genes. Additional findings show that we were able to identify two pathways that are critical for early eye development. One of which is the serine glycine biosynthetic pathway. And the second of which is a 
series of three signaling pathways that are interrelated with one another that contribute to cellular pluripotency. And with our study of the 63 IMPC genes, we were able to identify a novel gene called ACVR2A that causes cyclopia, which is a very rare phenotype. And I have an image here of what cyclopia looks like within the mouse embryo and how that corresponds to cyclopia within human infants. So in the future, we do have a fully written manuscript currently present and we are soon to submit this manuscript. And on top of that, we hope to present this work at ARVO, which is a national ophthalmology conference, as well as a few local conferences, such as the UC Davis Genomics Symposium, as well as a couple uh, research symposium at Oakland University at my medical school. I just want to thank Dr. Ala Moshiri. Thank you so much for being a wonderful mentor and providing me so many tools and information on how to become a better researcher and by challenging me every week to become better. And I also want to thank Mrs. Ann Cole for providing this opportunity to get my feet wet in ophthalmology and basically learn just like how amazing this field is. So thank you so much. I think Justine, you did a really great job of breaking down some very complicated information for us to all understand. And that's actually something you share in common with your mentor, Dr. Moshiri. So um, I think it's one thing that um, many people don't know is um, that UC Davis really is at the forefront of this type of research. And it's amazing to know we're only one of three centers um, involved in this international consortium. So. Um, it's something to be really proud of that um, you were able to accomplish this work and be um, exposed to that really type of cutting edge research environment. Um, our next student is Christopher Lowe, um, who comes to us from Brown University, my alma mater. Um, so he was working with Dr. Susanna Park. So, okay. Um, hi, I'm Christopher Lowe, a second year medical student um, who goes to Brown. And um, I just want to say that it was a wonderful opportunity for me to pursue a Cole scholarship during summer and to work with my mentor, Dr. Susanna Park. And um, I work on a project called comparing the retinal vascular density on fluorescent geography and OCT and geography in murine eyes with diabetic retinopathy. To give you some background, um, there are two imaging modalities, um, one called the force and geography and the other called the OCT and geography, often used in ophthalmology practice to study the retinal vasculature. Uh, the force and geography, as you can see on the left side of the picture over here, remains the gold standard um, and about 1 million studies are performed annually in the United States. Although the fluorescent angiography um, can reveal the details of the microvasculature of the retina, which is the backside of the eye, it requires an intravenous dye injection and a skilled photographer to take an image. It is also very time consuming and have lower resolution. Sometimes the fluorescent dye injection can cause side effects such as nausea and vomiting on patients. It can also be very challenging um, to find venous access for injection sometimes. On the other hand, the OCT in geography, as you can see on the bottom left side over here, is a newer imaging technique developed to evaluate the retinal blood flow uh, in the early 1990s. It is a non-invasive and does not require a dye injection and have higher resolution compared to the fluorescent in geography. It is rapidly becoming a indispensable clinical imaging tool in evaluating patients with retinal vascular disease. The retinal vascular information obtained using the fluorescent angiography and OCT angiography are similar, however, is not always the same in human patients. In preclinical research, um, especially the animal studies, OCT angiography is starting to be used but there is relatively limited information regarding the relative sensitivity of the fluorescent in geography versus OCT in geography in detecting the retinal vascular flow in the animals. And at UC Davis, we are fortunate enough to have the iPod retinal imaging uh, lab for the small animals equipped to obtain the both fluorescent in geography and OCT in geography images 
simultaneously in mice. The left picture here shows the custom-made uh, retinal imaging tool, which is capable of taking both fluorescent angiography and OCT angiography images on mice under anesthesia. The right picture here shows how the fluorescent angiography image and the OCT angiography image being captured simultaneously. So um, the purpose of this study was to evaluate whether the retinal vascular density noted in marine eyes with diabetic retinopathy using fluorescent angiography is comparable to those observed using OCT angiography. For my summer research project, I reviewed the FA and OCTA images obtained in mice with diabetic retinopathy from a prior study. The mice had streptocytosin-induced type 1 diabetes, and they developed the retinopathy by six months after the induction of the diabetes. I used the image J analysis with vessel plugin to measure the retinal vascular density, which were noted on fluorescent angiography and OCT angiography, as you can see images of two um, here below. And the vascular density measurement was obtained for the total area imaged on both FA and OCTA initially. But since some areas of the image did not appear in complete focus, we also evaluated the vascular density of the region of the retina and highest resolution of both FA and OCTA images. Total 13 paired FA and OCTA images of the murine eyes with diabetic retinopathy were studied. When retinal vascular density of the total retinal area on fluorescent angiography and OCT angiography were calculated, there was no significant correlation, as you can see over here, between the vascular density measured using FA and OCTA. The correlation value uh, had a the correlation value of R equal 0.259 and the p-value equal 0.202, which was not significant. However, when analysis was limited to the selected area of the image with optimal image resolution on fluorescent angiography, like here and OCT angiography, the vascular density on FA and OCT images were similar with p-value of 0.01. The images on the left side illustrates how image J analysis um, converted the both FA and OCTA images to the skeletonized images for the analysis. The mean area of the retina with optimal resolution selected for this analysis was about 4.54% of the total retinal image, ranging from 1.3 to 15.5%. So um, in conclusion, retinal vascular density obtained using fluorescent angiography correlates well with the retinal vascular density obtained using OCT angiography in murine eyes with diabetic retinopathy, only if limited to areas of the image with optimal resolution. But due to the small size of the murine eyes and resulting high curvature of the globe, the optimal image resolution was obtained only in a small area of the fundus using FA and OCTA. So this project was a preliminary study to evaluate the comparability of FA and OCTA in retinal vascular analysis. And there are some study limitations worth noting. First, we had a small sample size of only 13 paired images of FA and OCTA. Also, I only selected only one area of high resolution per eye, and the area that was selected averaged less than 5% of the total retinal area, thus was not representative of the total retina. And lastly, for areas of optimal image resolution, the larger vessels sometimes were included in the analysis, which may blunt more subtle differences in the retinal capillary densities between the fluorescent geography and OCT and geography. A future larger study is planned that address these limitations. So that was the end of the presentation and I would like to end by thanking members of the iPod retinal imaging team for obtaining the FA and OCTA images for analysis 
And I also want to thank Laura Shunk, a previous Cole Scholarship recipient, for introducing me to how to use the image analysis. And of course, Dr. Susanna Park, who served as my research mentor for my entire summer. I also thank the whole UC Davis Eye Center, and especially Mrs. Cole for supporting me through the Cole Scholarship Award. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks so much, Christopher. And um, we can see that you're uh, continuing to advance our knowledge of this uh, relatively new technology, which really has a lot of potential for us to test patients in a less invasive manner as we continue to move towards faster, less invasive studies. Our next student is Michael Wen, who also was mentored by Dr. Susanna Park. Um, and Michael is actually a UC Davis um, medical school student. Okay, I hope everyone can hear me. Um, okay, so hi everyone. Uh, my name is Michael and I'm a second year medical student at the UC Davis School of Medicine. My summer project with uh, Dr. Suzanne Park is on the repeatability of vascular density measurements of the intermediate uh, retinal plexus using OCT angiography. I realize this sounds really, really confusing, so I'll start off with a little bit of background. So what is OCT angiography? Well, OCTA is a non-invasive technique that can image the blood flow in the retina and choroid in a three-dimensional three manner. It uses laser light reflecting off of moving blood vessels um, or moving blood cells to image the vessels. So traditionally, if you look at the normal OCT image, you get this two-dimensional cross-sectional slice of the macula. Well, the OCTA uh, instead takes multiple images of the same cross-section across time and can observe things that are moving. So when we can see the, the, blood, uh, the blood cells moving, then um, in that way, we can combine all the images together and get something that's like this, where you get a more three-dimensional representation of all the vasculature. So the benefits of using this method is it's a really non-invasive procedure, and we don't need to use dyes or anything like Chris mentioned in his presentation in order to capture these uh, three-dimensional images. So just to break it down a little bit more, let's look at what these images exactly show. So right here, we can see the normal, a, a normal eye at what it would look like on OCTA. And the nice thing that we can use this for is that we can look at what the vascular density is like at various uh, thicknesses and at various layers. So you can see commercially, the instrument is able to calculate the density of the vasculature um, for the superficial layer, which is here on the left, and the deep layer here on the right. As you can see here, um, these pink lines kind of highlight um, the various densities, and you can see um, the three-dimensional representation is slightly different across the different layers, which makes sense. So prior studies have shown that these vascular density measurements are highly repeatable and reliable because these are normally done by the computer automatically. Uh, and using this technique, we can see how different pathologies affecting the vasculature may present. So as you can see here in proliferative diabetic retinopathy, the vasculature um, looks uh, different than just the normal eye. And we can see the same thing in sickle cell maculopathy. And so there are a lot of applications we can use OCTA for. And just to take one another step deeper, we can see how the commercial machine segments the vasculature into the two separate layers. However, when we normally perform histology, uh, traditionally, we find that there are actually three layers of blood vessels. And all of these are affected differently based on the severity of, vascular, uh, of retinal vascular diseases. So in order to accurately measure the vascular density of the three different layers, we would need to manually segment um, these layers by hand because the, the software isn't capable of doing so quite yet. And so traditionally, what we have is the superficial vascular plexus, which is similar to what the machine already calculates. And instead, the deep capillary complex, we have to break that down into the mid capillary plexus and the, deep, and the deep capillary plexus, or we can also call it the deepest one. And both of these are custom segmented. And by being able to correlate these three different layers to vascular um, diseases, it would be really helpful in clinical assessment. So we can see here on the, on the right, we have the three different layers. And so in my project specifically this summer was to focus on the repeatability and the reliability of the measurement of the intermediate capillary plexus layer. So to break down the methods of the research study, we imaged 86 eyes of 44 patients using OCTA. And each image was image was taken, or each eye was imaged twice by the same personnel using the same machine on the same day. 
So the OCT images include a three by three and a six by six millimeter scan, and as you can see here on the images. Um, one is of higher resolution, but shows less area. Um, the machine would then automatically generate the superficial capillary plexus or the SCP and the deep capillary plexus, the DCP, uh, automatically. And then from there, we would then break down the deep capillary plexus into the custom e intermediate capillary plexus and the custom deep capillary plexus. And again, my project focused on this specific layer. And, oh, sorry. Um, and moving, and to move forward, um, we also wanted to kind of see what the vascular density was of, of the layer for various subzones. So we then broke down each layer into the fovea, which is a, the one millimeter um, radius from the, cent from the center, the inner ring, which is three millimeters, and the outer ring, which is six millimeters. And of course, we just want, and we have the overall vascular density measurement, which is um, labeled as the ETDRS. And again, we just really wanted to see how reliable is the measurement at these uh, different parameters. And so this is kind of what we would come up with at, as the results. So this is just an example of, um, a of some of the data we have where we have each eye and we have the two different images taken on the same day by the same person um, for each zone. So for example, this is the entire macula zone. And after the images were done, we can then compare how does this measurement uh, compared to the original measurement. And if they are really similar, then we can, we can assume that the machine is um, reliable and this is a very effective way of measuring vascular density. So after all of this is done, uh, for um, basically all the eyes, we can then calculate the ICC or the intra-class correlation coefficient. And as you can see here in this little table, this is a representation of what the values um, how we, how we basically rated each value. So for example, an ICC of over 0.9 was considered an excellent repeatability, and an ICC below 0.5 was considered a poor repeatability. And so we then move on to our findings here, and we want to look, and I want to just focus primarily on the CICP over the summer. So this is again for the overall ETDRS, or the entire, the, the entire density of these images. And um, so you can see here for the SCP, which is the superficial layer and the DCP, these are the ones done automatically. And these two on the right are the ones that we segmented manually. Um, and the CDCP was done specifically by Dr. Park's team. I worked on the CICP over the summer. And when we can see, when we look at the results um, for both the three by three and the six by six images, we can see that the CICP was good to moderate in terms of vascular density, uh, density repeatability. And it is really, it is fairly comparable to the, um, the images that were automatically acquired by the machine. We then want to look at the breakdown of the subzones for both the three by three millimeter and the six by six millimeter images. So all the regions in these, as you can see here in the results, all the regions in both scans also had pretty uh, moderate to good repeatability. Um, we, we also want to note that for these images specifically, the, um, the number of eyes we, we examined was less. And the reason why is because we wanted to focus primarily just on the high quality images. And so we filtered out the poor quality images and just focused on those, on the good images instead. And you can see here we have the fovea, the ETDRS, and the three millimeter ring, as well as a six millimeter ring in the larger image. And Lastly, we also want to look at whether vascular density repeatability was affected by cystoid macular edema, or CME, which was, a patho which, is, which was a pathology previously found to affect vascular density measurement. So as you can see here in the images on the right, when, you when a patient has CME, it can greatly affect what the macula would look like, and thus the vascular density. And so for our study, we wanted to compare eyes with and without CME as shown here in these two tables. When using the smaller 3x3 scan, the eyes with and without CME both had good repeatability of vascular density measurement in the CICP, which is not too different than the machine-generated layers. However, when we looked at the larger images in the 6x6 millimeter, we can see that the CICP actually was poor for some regions in the eye, primarily in the fovea here and also in the, um, the peripheral retina right here. And so, um, we also wanted to finally take a look at what um, if vasculopathy would have an effect on this as well. 
And so we then calculate the repeatability for a subset of eyes with retinal vasculopathy, but without CME. And we found that the repeatability for the CICP was good using a smaller three by three scan again. But when we looked at the six by six scan, we saw a more a, a worse result in the repeatability, especially for the full image and the fovea image. And so to conclude, the repeatability of the vascular density measurement for the custom segmented thinner, thinner intermediate layer is reduced in eyes with CME and or renal vasculopathy using the larger OCTA scans. This is very likely because if you think about how, if you think about the custom segments, they are much thinner than the, than the automatically acquired in, um, segments done by the machine. And so this might be more susceptible to errors from morphologic changes due to, due to the pathology of CME and vasculopathy. And so when we do examine patients, um, especially in those with retinal vasculopathy or CME, we recommend using the smaller 3x3 three three OCTA scan as this may improve the, ac the accuracy of the vascular density measurement of the custom intermediate capillary plexus. And, and so by using the thinner one, this should hopefully uh, improve the accuracy of the machine. And so I would like to thank Dr. Park for being an amazing mentor and the opportunity to work on this wonderful project over the summer. Um, I never knew that ophthalmology had such potential in, in, in with all the potential technology that is constantly growing and improving. Um, and it was, real, it was a really, really fun experience to learn it. I would also love to thank Dr. Park's team who worked on this project and collected some of the, some of the data I presented today. I would also finally like to thank Mrs. Cole for the scholarship and the UC Davis Eye Center for the opportunity to conduct research in ophthalmology. Thank you. Well, I want to congratulate you on your work because it uh, helps us to move closer to answering important questions about newer technologies, like how we use them, um, which patients might they be most useful in, and how can they help us understand um, pathophysiology of disease in ways that maybe our old testing could not. Um, so congratulations on your work. Our next student is Alexander um, Rusakevich, who comes to us from Toro University. And again, his mentor was Dr. Glenn Yu. Uh, so hi, everyone. My name is uh, Alex Rusakevich. Uh, it's here. Uh, and I'm a second year student at Toro University, California, which is uh, near Vallejo, about an hour away from Sacramento. Uh, so just a little bit of background about me. Uh, I spent a gap year working uh, in an ophthalmology practice in Houston as a clinical research fellow, and that's where uh, my interest in the field was really solidified and my interest in research in general. So I was very excited about this opportunity, uh, and my mentor was Dr. Glenn Yu, and our project is called Optical Coherence Tomography and Geography Changes in Age-Related Macular Degeneration or OCTA changes in AMD for short. Uh, so I'll give you a brief overview of uh, our project that we had planned. Um, the goal of this project was to explore the role of uh, retinal vasculature specifically in uh, the disease process of AMD. Uh, so like a few of uh, other of the presenters mentioned, uh, OCTA is a non-invasive uh, technology that we have uh, that can show the structure of the retina uh, with more, with a higher resolution than uh, other previous modalities. Um, and so this study was based on a cross-sectional study uh, published by Lee et al. from Dr. Yu's team. Uh, that looked at 182 patients that were imaged with OCTA uh, and they had uh, wet and dry AMD and so uh, they used regression analysis to look at different clinical factors um, and especially vessel density um, measurements on OCTA uh, comparing wet and dry AMD to better understand uh, the role of retinal vessels in AMD. Um, so our project is a longitudinal follow-up on that uh, previous study. Uh, so those same 182 patients are set to receive uh, OCT and OCTA imaging two years from that previous visit date. Um, and we plan to analyze the changes that have occurred over those past two years 
Uh, and we expect based on the findings of that previous study that uh, larger changes in vessel density or, or bigger decreases in vessel density uh, should be associated with more severe disease progression and findings such as choroidal neovascularization and geographic atrophy. So this was all uh, the plan. Uh, unfortunately, COVID-19 happened and right as I was getting ready to start, uh, uh, we had some problems getting my EMR access and approval. Um, and so that I just actually was approved last week for EMR access and uh, things are starting to fall into place. So hopefully this will just be a speed bump in the grand scheme of things. Um, but thankfully, Dr. Yu was uh, kind enough to find other projects for me to work on and keep me busy. So I'll, I'll touch on some of those. I don't have any results to present yet, but stay tuned. So one of the other projects I worked on was a clinician scientist survey. And uh, this was an electronic survey that was sent out in 2019 to a couple hundred of uh, clinician scientists in ophthalmology specifically. Uh, and the aim of this study was to uh, just better understand uh, factors such as uh, demographics, gender, um, the funding sources, et cetera, and how those factors contribute to academic success, uh, salary, career satisfaction, and the, how they influence the grant seeking timeline in general. Uh, and the context of this study is that there were several prior reports uh, published uh, describing the sort of endangerment of this um, career path. Uh, and we all know how important clinician scientists in ophthalmology are. And so hopefully this type of study characterizing and hearing from clinician scientists themselves uh, can guide strategies in the future to help support this and make this a viable career path. So 99 respondents were included in the study. And I'll just touch on a couple of the key findings that we found. Um, in our regression analysis, we found that uh, time from first academic appointment to first, acad or first independent grant uh, or R01 equivalent grant um, was one of the most significant factors uh, contributing to future success. So in other words, uh, the faster a clinician scientist was able to obtain their first independent grant, the more successful they were in future um, academic funding. So this suggests uh, importance in maybe future interventions in early career, uh, early in the career. And then we also looked at uh, career satisfaction. So here uh, in a variety of measurements, uh, we can see that the vast majority of respondents were uh, quite satisfied with uh, their career. And interestingly, in regression, we found that uh, time since uh, first appointment uh, was significantly associated with increased uh, satisfaction. And so, in other words, uh, clinician scientists who are more experienced or in advanced stages of their careers uh, tended to be more satisfied with the career choice. Uh, and additionally, I just want to mention that some recent reports have come out uh, regarding COVID-19 uh, and the impact that that um, could have on research funding, and they expect a large reduction in research funding and Medicaid funding. Um, and some other studies have shown that uh, women and underrepresented groups in research uh, are disproportionately affected. Um, by the pandemic. And so this uh, is even more important to understand and, and try to help mitigate some of those uh, issues. And then another project uh, that I worked a little bit on uh, was a Zika virus study. So this was an experimental study in uh, non-human primates um, to better understand uh, the pathophysiology of uh, congenital Zika syndrome. Uh, so um, there were pregnant rhesus macaque monkeys were inoculated with Zika virus, and this was um, passed to the fetus in utero. Um, and we know that uh, congenital Zika syndrome is associated with birth defects in humans, uh, such as microcephaly and ocular defects like colobomas, et cetera. 
and uh, human or uh, primate models were used uh, because uh, rodent models are uh, tend not to show the same defects as humans, and so this is a better model for the disease. Um, and so I assisted with the OCT uh, imaging portion of the study. The uh, infant monkeys were followed over two years uh, and evaluated over a variety of um, factors from histology to clinical measurements and OCT. So I assisted with the manual segmentation and data collection and analysis of the OCT data. And so here I just have a couple of images uh, you can see in the gross pathological specimens, an A shows a large chorioretinal lesion uh, and some smaller chorioretinal lesions in B, um, which we can also see in the fundus photos. Uh, and in these serial OCTs, we can see the progression of the atrophy over two years. Um, interestingly, though, we did find that uh, despite all of these uh, atrophic lesions, uh, the eyes did exhibit normal ocular growth and retinal development in general compared to uh, control healthy infant monkeys. And so hopefully this postnatal uh, two-year follow-up will help to provide additional insight into the uh, understanding of congenital Zika syndrome. And that's all I have to share, but I just wanted to say a big thank you to uh, UC Davis for providing this opportunity. And of course, Mrs. Cole and Dr. Yu. Um, it's been a great opportunity, especially for me with no ophthalmology home program. It's been uh, invaluable, so thank you. I think you did a great job, Alexander. Um, and you exhibited one really important characteristic of a good physician and good ophthalmologist which is adaptability when um, conditions rapidly change. So I think you produced some really interesting work here um, that will not only help you, but other um, future clinician scientists in their career paths. Um, and it really shows us the diversity of research that you can do um, uh, in your career. Um, Dr. Yu is a great mentor and an example of um, multiple diverse research interests, um, really multifaceted career. So thank you so much. Our next student is Andy Xiao. Um, Andy Xiao is a student at University of Nevada in Reno, and his mentor for his project was Dr. Alam Mushiri. Hi there, thank you for the introduction. Um, yeah, uh, so my name is Andy Xiao. I'm a third year student over at uh, Reno, Nevada School of Medicine. Um, my mentor, Dr. Alam Mushiri. And uh, my project is revealing candidate inherited retinal disorder genes through genome-wide screening of knockout mice. And so much uh, inherited retinal disorders um, are a big array of disorders that all share characteristics of photoreceptor dysfunction and death and consequent vision loss. And so the very important feature of um, IRDs is that they're genetically heterogeneous. What that means is that different genes that are disrupted in these patients will all sort of lead into a same or similar pathology. And given that, um, they're, they're quite difficult in diagnosis because it becomes a whole smorgasbord of genes that are seemingly unrelated, all cause the same issue. So screening isn't always intuitive. Um, and so because of the rarity of IRDs, um, there's been fairly limited funding and interest into diagnosis and new avenues for treatment. This lack of research leads to multiple physician visits and it's frustrating for the patient because this slows their diagnosis and it increases the burden financially and emotionally for them. And of course, this also uh, increases the financial cost on our healthcare system. And so my project focuses on two particular IRDs, uh, the first being Usher syndrome. Usher syndrome is a multi-system disorder. Um, however, it's denoted by sensory and neuronal hearing loss, as well as retinitis pigmentosa, or RP. And so if you look at the image to the top right, that's a typical fundus photo for um, retinitis pigmentosa, that dark black-red uh, pigment towards the um, top right border. That's 
that's pretty typical finding in uh, RP. And so the other IRD we focused on was familial exudative vitreal retinopathy or fever. And so with fever, um, presentation is highly variable. variable. Some of these patients um, experience very minimal to asymptomatic uh, vision disturbance. Meanwhile, others suffer a near complete loss of vision. However, what unifies all fever patients is that they all have an avascular peripheral retina. And what that means is that the peripheries of their retina, for one reason or another, lack blood vessels. And this lack of blood vessels sort of leads to um, many subsequent issues. Uh, the eyeball will try to, uh, the retina will try to uh, compensate for this lack of blood flow by creating new blood vessels um, in a process known as neovascularization. This growth um, of new blood vessels can cause a, a wealth of other issues, including, including fibrotic changes to the retina and subsequent detachments. And so, as you are probably now well aware, thanks to Ms. Justine's um, presentation, the IMPC, or International Mouse Phenotyping Consortium, is a uh, database for many single gene knockout mice. Um, they're categorized per their phenotype. And if you look at the image, the top right uh, sort of has these uh, cartoon um, breakdowns for what phenotypes are significant and with what not what aren't. And so the orange phenotypes are the significant, the blue are insignificant, and the gray aren't tested. And so they also provide plenty of other information, including um, viability, uh, including a sex breakdown of uh, various phenotype presentations, as well as uh, zygosity in these presentations. And so the nice thing about IMPC is that it's a standardized procedure. Um, all of them use the same model mouse, the C57BL6N mouse, and they all follow the same four-month panel of tests. And with this, it becomes a very nice standardized piece of very invaluable um, data. And this is, of course, made possible through the collaboration between numerous academic centers across the world. And so my project um, was largely database mining. Uh, as you can see, just to give you an example of what we looked for, we took a bunch of um, retinal gene uh, or genes that were knocked out in mice that had subsequent retinal disruptions. And then from those genes, we looked through past literature to see if they'd ever been um, implicated in mouse eye or retinal disease pathology, human eye or disease retinal pathology, if they've ever been published in general, um, and uh, because of our interest in Usher syndrome, if they've ever been implicated in hearing problems for either mice or humans. And so another important database for us was RetNet. And what RetNet is, is basically just a list of what we consider to be the gold standard IRD causative genes. And so as of September 2020, we have 273 maps, so it's quite a few. But unfortunately, that still leaving, despite this many retinal disease genes being mapped, we're still experiencing about 20 to 50% of IRD patients not receiving diagnosis even with this list. And so there's still, still work to be done on this front. And so just to give you an example of what um, the mice look like uh, under fundus photography. Um, we collected a few particularly uh, compelling images from our list of knockout mice. And so the top left, of course, is the uh, wild type um, mouse model that I'd mentioned earlier. And so you can see a variety of disease pathologies. Um, down towards the bottom right, of course, we see very marked pigmentary changes that are quite, quite compelling. Um, TIMP3, uh, you can see quite a bit of arterial leakage. Um, and NCALD, uh, there's quite a bit of uh, uh, vascular tortuosity as well as angulation. And so these mice all have pretty compelling retinal changes um, thanks to these single gene knockouts. And the 
fact that we have access to all these fundus photos make for a very easy um, corroboration between the phenotypes that IMPC reports as well as our own judgment upon their fundus photos. And so what we did with um, the list of, uh, of uh, IRD genes or IRD potential genes is that we ran them through string. What string is, is a proteomics database. So it studies protein-protein interactions. And what is unique about string is that it does, it categorizes protein-protein interactions on the basis of already established through literature interactions, as well as predictive modeling through their relationship to similar proteins. And so you can see, thanks to that, you get clusters that um, sort of help to tie genes that formerly may have not been corroborated with one another towards one another through a series of um, interactions through subsequent um, proteins. And so if you can see uh, the, green, um, the green nodes are all IMPC candidate genes. The gray nodes are all RETNET gold standard genes. And we had a, a minor amount of crossover um, as you can see by the um, gold nodes. So we took a look at these clusters. And so one interesting cluster was the Usher syndrome candidates. So we took all the gold standard Usher syndrome candidate genes and they all have interactions with one another, which is pretty consistent with what the literature has to say about Usher syndrome. Um, however, what was interesting about our candidate list of mice with both retinal and hearing phenotype changes was that um, there were quite a few that followed a peculiarity that we see in Usher syndrome model animals, and that's that they share two features. Um, first of all, that they're autosomal recessive. So they have to be homozygous, the homozygotes must be viable for it to suggest that um, there might be an autosomal transmittance of that gene pathology. Um, so it might, it's not carried on the X or Y and it's um, viable for that um, organism to exist despite having lost two copies of the gene. And it also is important that they have a certain behavioral um, abnormality. So these mice uh, models all have uh, what's called circling behavior. They all lack vestibular function in their inner ear. And so they'll often just circle around, which unifies all the mouse models. And so from our candidate list, we had quite a few ping up for both of these features. And these are listed in the yellow. But all of these genes presented in this table had concomitant retinal and hearing phenotype abnormalities. And so when we looked at Panther through uh, Panther, another um, proteomics protein protein database, however, this one is different from string in that it predicts through evolutionary relationships between the genes. And so when we looked at um, Panther modeling for those genes, we noticed that all of them shared binding um, capacity. And furthermore, when we looked at uh, Panther modeling for the rest of our genes, we noticed that um, there were quite a few interesting pathways that popped up. And so this might hinge on a touch esoteric for this discussion, but these assessments suggest that the genes that ping up on this pathway report play a role in a certain set of functions within the uh, cell. And so the pathways that popped up for us were the FGF signaling pathway, the interleukin signaling pathway, and the PDGF signaling pathway. And you can see the list of genes that pinged up in those particular pathways. And so when we dug deeper into these genes um, and their known functions and their known associations, we saw that one kept coming up and that was RASA1. And so what was interesting was the RASA1 had its own self-contained gene cluster. And within this gene cluster, they all had um, vascular type abnormalities. And so we sort of, and then looking further in the RASA1 knockout mouse, it had a very interesting feature in that it lacked retinal blood vessels, much like the ones, much like the phenotype we see in fever. And so we looked around some more and we found a few more interesting vascular type gene clusters. And what it sort of led us to is an in-depth 
literature review that revealed what we believe to be a novel um, angiogenic pathway within the retina. So what we see here is that all these red genes are genes that we know cause fever. Um, however, only the top four, norin, LRP5, frizzled 4 and T-SPAN12 are genes that have been established within the gold standard of um, fever causative genes. And as for the pathway that we know causes fever, this is all part of a certain pathway called the wind signaling pathway. And so the wind signaling pathway goes all the way down to about beta cat catenin, and that's as far as we know currently. However, if we look at the interactions between these proteins through literature review, we find that this pathway extends far further than simply the WENT pathway. It extends into um, several known angiogenic pathways, such as PDGFR, such as notch signaling. Um, for the sake of this discussion, we won't dive too deeply into this, but it does seem to explain why there's so much genetic heterogeneity within fever, because RAC1, um, a known causative um, a gene that's been known to, to cause a similar phenotype uh, to fever in mice, and NORIN, a gene that we have established as a fever causative gene, have very, very little to do with each other at face value. But when you sort of connect the pieces through the literature view, through the proteomics database um, information, it paints a fairly compelling image that there might be a greater sort of unifying pathway between all these independent pathways, tying it all together into sort of convoluted but neat picture. And so this was further corroborated by the fact that when we added these key pathway nodes, such as RAC1, such as PDGFR, uh, FAK, TNC, P38, and ILK, they all kept leading back to the same gene cluster with RASA1 in string analysis. And you can see that um, on the right, uh, this analysis uh, really just ties these interactions to this particular gene cluster and not much else in terms of anything else. And so again, this is all sort of circumstantial evidence, but the, taking each bit of circumstantial evidence together, it does sort of paint a stronger argument altogether that there might be something happening altogether in this uh, pathway. And so in summary, um, we have 273 established human IRD genes on retina as of September 2020. Um, of course, 25 to 50% of these patients remain unsolved after, even after whole genome sequencing, um, suggesting there's plenty of unknown IRD genes out there that we've yet to discover. Uh, we personally have identified 181 mouse retinal disease genes from IMPC. And of these 181, eight have been established in the gold standard and 173 are novel for humans. Um, 19 of these 173 have been linked to mouse retinal diseases, which leaves 154 for novel mouse IRD genes. So lastly, I, of course, I'd like to thank everyone that made um, this project possible. Mrs. Ann Cole for her generosity, um, Dr. Alamo Shiri for his mentorship, and um, everyone at the UC Davis Eye Center for the means to perform this research. And here are my references. Thanks so much, Andy. I think we really see between you and Justine, um, really strong illustration of how this International Mouse Phenotyping Consortium um, really uh, has empowered us to study rare and also very devastating diseases. So you had mentioned earlier in the presentation that sometimes families really um, can lose a lot of hope because we don't have a lot of research. And um, hopefully this kind of, um, movement and international collaboration will allow us to provide some hope to these families down the line. Our last student um, presenting this evening is uh, Sarah Tului, who also comes to us from California North State University. And her mentor for her project was uh, Dr. Glenn Yu. Um, all right, hi, my name is Sarah Tului. I'm the second year at California North State University College of Medicine, just south of Sacramento. And my mentor was Dr. Yu. So what is macular degeneration? Essentially, it's degeneration of the macula, which provides central vision. And so when you have the degeneration of this area, you can get distortion and loss of central vision. Um, there are two types. There's the dry and there's the wet type. The dry type is more common. It's the non-exudated type. 
And what you'll see is the, this like fatty white, um, fatty yellow deposit actually in between the brush membrane and the retinal pigment epithelium that can gradually cause loss of vision, um, central vision over time. And it is reversible, um, you know, antioxidants can help, um, vitamins can help, et cetera. Um, however, our project was more focused on the wet um, type of age-related macular degeneration, which encompasses more of bleeding secondary to like an, a, a choroidal neovascularization, as mentioned by previous students. And what it, what I mean by that is, you know, there's a layer below the retina called the choroid, where you have vessels that can extend out. And um, in situations like wet AMD, you'll have, um, you know, proliferation of VEGF, so vascular endothelial growth factor, and that'll um, cause bleeding, essentially the excess fluid and proteins that can damage the photoreceptors. And so, and this is a really acute loss of vision. And so we really, it's, it's really important that we are able to identify biomarkers that can prevent the progression of disease, of disease from an early to a late stage AMD. And so that's, that's kind of the focus of our project. Um, and I'll move forward. So who gets AMD? Um, there are a lot of risk factors for it. You know, eating a high fatty diet can predispose you to the dry type maybe. Um, you, know, you know, being overweight, um, smoking, um, being elderly, having hypertension, um, cardiovascular diseases, a family history of AMD, as well as being of Caucasian descent do predispose you to age-related macular degeneration. Um, so our focus was the retina. Uh, I think the retina really does provide an invaluable tool that allows you to study kind of the structural changes that occur with um, these vascular diseases. Um, and I kind of think of it like the mirror into the brain, you know, is a lot of um, interesting uh, correlations there. And so the choroid vasculature has really been debated, you know, its role, it's, you know, it does it provide a uh, protective factor um, in alleviating the progression of disease. And so that's kind of been um, the work that Dr. Yuri has been focusing on. So previous work has shown that the presence of the ciliaretinal artery, um, noted by the arrow, um, actually kind of serves as like a protective factor against the progression to wet AMD. And um, so we're trying to seek uh, to explore if there are differences between the circulation and perfusion um, through the vessels in the retina and the progression of um, AMD from early to late stages. So um, I used a software from the University of Wisconsin called IVIN. Um, it's been used by only a few individuals, not much out there, but had some difficulty troubleshooting the a software, but now we're up and running. Um, it's used to measure the retinal vessel diameter. And what it does, it, it uses the field one fundus photographs um, and you're um, analyzing a certain zone that allows you to fill in each of the vessels um, by artery and vein. And then from there, you can use the different re retinal calibers known as CRAE, CRVE, and AVR. And what these calibers are is they are measuring essentially the six largest arteries or arterioles and venules in the retina, and it's averaging them. And the AVR is the ratio of CRAE to CRVE. And so um, we're kind of interested to see, you know, what are the associations between these values um, in combination with logistical regression analysis from previous um, work that Dr. Yu did. Um, to kind of estimate, um, you know, a biomarker for predictive risk analysis. Here's an example of kind of the, the work that I've been doing. There are 1,200 images that I've been going through, and essentially, um, along with some help from uh, some undergrads, essentially what we're doing is we're uploading these images into this software, and the software gives us the opportunity to fill in each of these vessels by, art, by artery and vein. So as you can see, the veins are thicker, um, and they're darker and noted in blue versus the arteries are red. Um, and after filling in each of these vessels, um, I'll hit calculate to the side. And if you look under the par habard equation, there's a CRAE, CRVE, AVR value. Those values will be um, imperative in our analysis moving forward. And it'll allow us to make a distinction between um, the vasculature and progression of disease in our patients. Oops. So um, yeah, essentially our hypothesis, you know, is that there is some sort of association um, for risk for CNV development. 
for example, patients who are elderly and may have hypertension, may have thinner arterioles and therefore less perfusion to that area. Um, we're interested to see if there are any morphological alterations as well um, that can reflect variations in the vessels. So where do we stand? We're currently finishing up the total uh, data collection um, and we'll conduct the analysis this year. Um, we hope to start the manuscript by the end of 2020 and published by early 2021. Um, but yeah, I'm really excited about this project and I'm glad to see it come to an end in terms of the data collection part. It's been a lot of work, but I've, I've been enjoying it greatly. Um, I wanted to thank um, Ms. Ann Cole for her generous uh, donation, Dr. Yu for your incredible mentorship and your communication skills, just everything. I feel like I've learned so much from you and I'm just so appreciative of um, your patience and your support, um, as well as UC Davis Eye Institute for this opportunity to engage in ophthalmology research. Thanks Thank so much, Sarah. I think um, we, we really also look forward to the product of your research, um, further research endeavors down the line, because as you know, one of the most important questions patients always have is what's going to happen to me? And I think this work will help us to be able to tell patients what to expect and also, um, you know, to give them some sort of um, way in which they can plan their future um, around this um, chronic disease. Um, I wanted to thank all of you and congratulate you for clearly so much hard work. And I know it was a real challenge this year because of um, the curveball that COVID threw at us. And obviously we would have enjoyed having you present with us um, in person, um, spending much more time um, with us face to face. And hopefully in the future, we can get back to some of that contact. Some of you are close by and we hope to continue to see you. Um, your work and your efforts and the students that have gone before you, you're really the legacy of um, Dr. William Cole um, and you're continuing to carry on um, some of his passion for ophthalmology and for education. We are immensely grateful to Mrs. Ann Cole for your continued commitment to um, the advancement of the field of ophthalmology, the education of students, um, and I hope that you know, we can all understand and see from these presentations and their diversity how this kind of work really has the potential to change lives of patients down the line and also your lives as future ophthalmologists. So thank you for spending this evening with us. Um, hopefully we'll get to do this in person again. Um, and we wish you good health from UC Davis Eye Center um, and a good evening. I would like to, I would like also to say, first of all, no one has thanked Annie Bake yet, but Annie, you have done a remarkable job in stewarding this program, and we thank you so much for your uh, organization, for your care of the students. You've really done an amazing job. And Anne, uh, I hope you will have the opportunity to see these presentations and to recognize that your gift really has uh, reverberated across the country. and. Uh, has produced uh, students who are curious and who are doing wonderful work. In fact, some of the patients, some of the presentations tonight were well above my pay grade, but I, I thank you all for doing such wonderful work. I would also like to thank the Redness Service for really stepping up and hosting our students. At the same time, I want to remind the students that there is something called a cornea through which you cannot even see the retina if it's not clear. So. There are other opportunities in research and we hope you'll come to the front of the eye at some point. So thank you. Thank you all for your participation tonight. It was really wonderful hearing these presentations. Thank you everyone and thank you Annie and good night. Thank you.